So the, the lesson from our Hebrew scriptures for this morning comes to us from the book of 2 Kings. I will read to you our lectionary verses today, which are from chapter 5, verses 1 through 14, and extend the invitation that you keep on reading. There is a lot more to this story than that which we will read today. But hear now God's word. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man, and he was in high favor with his master, because by him God had given victory to Aram. So the man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Arameans, on one of their raids, had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his lord what the girl, uh, what the girl from the. So Naaman went in, and told his lord, the king, just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, "Go then, and I will send along a letter to the king of Israel." So Naaman went, taking with him ten talents of silver. 6,000 shekels of gold and 10 sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his leprosy. Now when the king of Israel read this letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me. Then he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots. And he halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go, wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry, and he went away saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Anyone else said anything like this? Are not Abana and Parfar, the rivers in Damascus, better than the waters of all of Israel? Could I not wash in them to be clean? So he turned and he went away in rage. But his servants approached him and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was, wash and be clean? So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And Naaman's flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. This is the word of our God. Thanks be to God. Oh, there's a lot to say in this passage, right? Sit tight. No. All right, friends, today's Hebrew scripture is rich, isn't it? The least surprising element of our story is the one we've kind of come to expect in Scripture, that a man would be healed from leprosy because of the faithfulness of God and God's people. Yet as this story unfolds, we recognize that this miraculous story, this healing, is part of a much larger narrative, and it's a complicated one. It's one that not only crosses, but braids together 
strands of religious and political lines. In the 14 verses of our text, we learn a lot about Naaman. He is described as righteous and also arrogant. He is a victorious uh, army commander and a leper. He is one who is subject to the authority of the king of Aram, yet he is one who himself wields authority over soldiers and slaves and his own spouses, including this young Israelite girl that we learn early in our text was a political prisoner taken during a raid of Israel. Naaman is complicated. Now in the same story, we see that he is both strong and vulnerable, righteous and unrighteous, humble and arrogant. And his story offers for us one of many case studies in the intricacies of power. Naaman's story embodies the messy dynamics and tensions of his time and ours. That especially when politics, religion, societal imbalances shaped by race, class, gender, and it shows how Naaman's own world is shaped by these forces, even as his choices, profession, and needs are impacted by them as well. See, Naaman's own experience of security is grounded in military might, in wealth, in enshrined masculinity, and in royal favor. But Naaman is also beholden to a worsening illness he cannot cure, and his healing is dependent upon those he has othered. An Israelite slave girl, his own servants, a prophet of a foreign nation, Israel. Now in Naaman's own story, God is at work in spite of and through the complexities and the messes of human life together. God is once more the God we praise, a gracious God who over and over and over again is a God who makes all things new. God's power proclaimed through the voice of the most powerless character in the text yields healing across societal and political lines. And yes, even in spite of moral imperfection, God heals. Why? Because that's what God does. And Naaman, if we keep on reading, becomes a follower, a convert, a believer in the living God. The Jordan River becomes his own mikvah pool. God saved him from the wretchedness of his own condition, not just on the outside, but deep down in his heart. There is a lot of good news throughout these complex verses. And there are many correlations between Naaman's day and ours. And there is a lot I could preach in these verses. And candidly, over the last few weeks, I have started and shifted this sermon many times. So I did think about preaching an important sermon, a timely sermon about the need to listen to women's voices. I thought about preaching about how we must name that this would certainly be needed in our current world today in which women's voices are being increasingly silenced and marginalized. I wanted to call attention to the enslaved girl, many times an outcast, based on her gender, her age, social status, religious, and ethnic heritage. Now in this story, she's easily identified as the one with the fewest rights, if we could even think of any rights she possesses at all. In our case study of power, she has the least. Yet she is the one through whom God's work is initiated. She is the one through whom God's compassionate care is extended. She is the one whose loving suggestion and creative thinking propels the saving work physically and spiritually that is to come. What would have happened if no one had listened to her? So she plants this idea 
of how Naaman might receive the healing of the God that she knows, even at her own young age and even in her own situation, to be faithful. And she knows that God's faithfulness transcends the lines we draw in human relationships and the obstacles we erect to keep us apart. And even the struggles we experience in our day-to-day -day lives. And so she points her master to the loving, living God. All right, so there's a whole sermon here about how God chooses to work over and over again through those who do not have power in society, those deemed to be the least and the lowliest, lowliest. Now that sermon would remind us to listen to the voices of those on the margins and to look for life-giving change and spirit-filled hope that comes through their wisdom and courage and strength. Now I might even go on to point out, if I were gonna preach that sermon, that... <laughs> The, evangel the evangelist witness of Mary, the mother of Jesus, of her Magnificat, of the Samaritan woman in the Gospel of John and her evangelism throughout all of Samaria that she had encountered a living God, and even, you know, the witness of the women at the garden tomb. And I would remind us that God's redemptive hope is often found in the voices of women especially those who are too young or too old, who are unmarried or barren, ignored or overlooked, or the most outcast in all of society, God has not forgotten them. God works through them and brings not only them, but others to new life. All right, but that's not the focus for today. So here's option two. I thought about preaching about the social dynamic of othering that gets Naaman all tangled in knots. He sees himself as, let's make the list, elite and righteous and successful and acclaimed, and he sees everyone but the king as not. He is favored, and he knows it. I kind of wanted to sing, if you're favored and you know it, clap your hands, right? He is set apart and he is set above the world in which he lives. And he is set apart and above this world by his own ego. His ailment was the only thing holding him back or pulling him down, should I say. Yet even with a condition that would render others as outsiders, outcasts, untouchables and unlovables, he has insider status. What is going on with this guy? He is worthy of a king's diplomatic initiative to ensure his healing. He expects a red carpet treatment from an Israelite prophet. And God challenges his perspective. Through the unwillingness of the prophet to grant him even a formal audience, right? Elisha is not going to be bothered with coming out and speaking to him directly. Through the requirement that he be bathed in the muddy foreign waters of the Jordan, through the sheer reality that it is slaves who open the door to his healing and wholeness, Naaman is presented with a divine opportunity to see things differently. Yes, see, God heals him but not because God prefers Naaman over all the others, but because that's what God does. The path toward healing requires Naaman to listen to those he has oppressed and othered. It requires that Naaman cross societal lines and work with the enemy. It requires that Naaman assume a posture of humility and obedience that is unfamiliar to him. It requires him to change, and he does. The story continues. He becomes a believer. He is transformed not only physically, but spiritually, inside and out. But that's not the sermon I'm going to preach today either. Now see, while there is truth in these possible sermons, there's truth about God, and there's truth in this text for us today as humans living in a complicated socio-political, historical world that is messy and fraught with sin and otherness and oppression and inequity, 
Whew. These weren't the texts. These weren't the sermons I was going to fully preach. Because I have a problem with a story and I just cannot let it go. I have a problem with the fact that everyone, and I mean everyone, in the story works together that, to make sure that Naaman is healed, but nobody stops to say, hey, what about that little girl? Everyone works together to make sure that the decent guy with a decent amount of power gets a decent health, but no one stops to say, what about that small child you stole from her family and enslaved? Sure, he has a fresh perspective and he's healed from a terrible disease that I wouldn't wish on anyone. Sure, he professes belief in the God who heals him. These are unequivocally good things. But it does not need to be an either or answer in our text or in our world. Where is the third way? See, I can't get over the fact that his decent life got better all because a young girl was stolen from her family when her nation was raided by Naaman's army. I can't get over the fact that she was enslaved and ground to the, house, the role of housemaid to Naaman's wife. I want to pull my hair and cry, hey, what about that girl? See, she uses her voice to bring freedom to another. But who is going to speak up for her? She professes her faith and, and ensures another encounter that others encounter the living God. But whose faithfulness will change her life? Now, don't get me wrong. I am grateful for her. I am proud of her. I am in awe of her. I am in awe of her wisdom and more so her compassion, her ability to affect change from her lowly social situation, her ability to love the one who has oppresses her. And I am in awe of a God who works through her to heal another. And I confess that I need to learn from her, especially when I want to cuss someone out who took the parking spot that I had my blinker on to claim, or when I, and I know that I need to f exhibit my own faithfulness to God, even when life deals me a blow, even when I am treated inequitably, and when my faith in God feels like all I have to hang my hat on at the end of the day. But what about that girl? What about the unnamed child being held in captivity? What about the girl who was stolen from her family, her land, her safe space, and forced to serve her enemy? Who is looking out for her? Who is showing her compassion? Who is laboring for justice and wholeness and a decent life for her? Is it even responsible or faithful for us to notice all that God has done for Naaman. If we just skip over the injustice done to this girl, the injustice that this text has the courage to name, can we truly celebrate the triumph of God's loving power in this text if we don't stop and name that this girl is more than a plot device? I mean, even the author of 2 Kings gives us more information than we get about most unnamed female characters in scripture. She's an Israelite. She is very young. She was stolen from her family during a raid of Israel. She is the servant of Naaman's wife. How can we just follow Naaman's story without noticing those he encountered along the way? Those whose knowledge or help granted him the fullness of life he desired. How can we not point out the injustice of it all? But we do it all the time. We do it not just when we read Naaman's story, but when we navigate our own daily lives. We overlook the real lived experience of those who labor in sweatshops to handcraft the t-shirt we order online that's delivered to our front porch. We overlook the needs of mothers with swollen breasts who are back in the office or factory or behind the cash register just weeks after giving birth because they had to choose between staying home with their newborn or going without a paycheck to ensure their family eats in the only developed nation in the world that offers a pittance, if called nothing, in the way of parental leave. We enshrine the importance and needs of the, and well-being of some over and over again while ignoring 
how the complexities of our life together might wound or oppress another. Now, I know you've all been hearing the news and lamenting the litany of rulings that have come forth from the Supreme Court of the United States in the last 10 days. Ruling after ruling have brought forth harrowing examples of this dynamic. The court's actions of the past week not only legislate a woman's private medical decisions in a way that is unparalleled, but also issue clear statements about the court's perceived supremacy of maleness, Christianness, and whiteness. Justices have boldly spoken off the record, but on the record, about their hope that these actions of the court would continue to undo codified law and civil liberties for same-sex couples, for um, individuals to have access to contraception, and even perhaps interracial marriage, and the list goes on. And see, I can't help that as a people of faith, we are called to engage. We are not to just sit back and affirm the happy endings for some without scanning the scene all the way to the margins and adding to the complicated, painful dialogue the question, whoa, whoa, but what about them? See, what about those who are ignored or abused? What about those who are and have been systemically oppressed, undervalued, and critically harmed? What about those who have been caught up in political posturing, in the violence of wards, and the wounds of systemic racism and sexism? See, we cannot as a society know wholeness unless we are willing to wade into the complexities of the ways in which we have sinned against each other and God back in the day and today. See, what about those who are treated as property and not people? What about those whose current realities have been shaped by centuries of inequity that have shaped our nation's past? As a people of faith, we cannot fully celebrate Naaman's healing or conversion until we stop and say, all right, that's great, but what about that slave girl? You know, the one who uh, knew better than everyone else? The one who was responsible for Naaman's healing in the first place? the one who, in spite of her social location, extended compassionate care. And similarly, as a people of faith, we cannot celebrate even our own nation's independence until we stop and say, okay, great, but what about those who are still bound by interpersonal and systemic enshrinements of racism, sexism, homophobia, cissexism, and the list goes on. See, we have a call before us, people of God. We are called to not just say, hey, what about me? But to say, what about them? What about us? Then we are called to enact the belief that one of us is not well until all of us are whole. You know, Paul wrote about that in the 12th chapter of the first letter to the Corinthians, and you can also add that to your reading list for the week. We are called to challenge the status quo, to push back against forces that try to say that rights and liberties and food and clean water and access to health care are only owed to some by saying, whoa, wait, what about them? We are called to speak up and to listen and to act and to question and to have hard conversations and to be uncomfortable that we might extend the loving, redemptive care of God to all. For you know what? That healing that God offered to Naaman, it just wasn't for some fancy guy who people liked. That healing grace, that's the kind of wholeness that God desires to offer to all of God's people. May we partner with our redemptive, healing, loving God so that all of God's people will know God's love, will know God's peace, will know God's justice, and will know the wholeness that comes through the
the living and loving God we serve. Friends, may it be so. Amen.